evening. I'm Melissa Perry, Dean of the College of Public Health at George Mason University. And to our viewers uh, watching on GMU television, to our members of the audience here at Merton Hall uh, on the campus of uh, George Mason University in Fairfax, and to our distinguished guests and panelists, welcome. This is our American Public Health Week. We have a variety of different events happening this week. I wanted to acknowledge the very generous support of two members of our advisory board, uh, um, Patty Hairsign and also Yoshi Davidson for sponsoring our public health events this week. Our goal is to raise as much awareness and dialogue and exchange as it relates to cutting edge issues in public health. And we're very focused on providing information to our students. Tonight's panel is looking at violence prevention. Violence prevention in, in the United States as a public health problem. Really violence prevention as a public health epidemic. And so tonight, we've invited a number of thought leaders in a, with a very eclectic perspective um, to comment on their work and also to provide dialogue and information for all of us as a nation as we seek to reduce violence, gun violence, and really achieve a societal environment of peace and calm and security. Violence perpetuated against specific populations, hate crimes, murder rates, and gun violence have been on the rise in recent years in the United States. There's been a significant increase in the number of murders with both the FBI and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reporting a roughly 30% increase in the US murder rate between 2019 and 2020. This trend seems to be continuing in 2021. Violence is a health equity issue that disproportionately affects certain communities more than others. Communities of color who are poor and marginalized populations bear a disproportionate brunt of violence, many factors pertaining to the impacts of structural racism. These populations are also more likely to experience the negative health consequences of physical injuries, mental health problems, and also chronic diseases. Data also show a rise in hate crime incidents, with nearly 10,000 hate crimes reported in 2021, representing an 11, uh, almost 12% increase from the previous year. The majority of single bias incidents were motivated by the offenders bias toward race, ethnicity, ancestry, with anti-black or African-American hate crimes being the largest category. Incidents related to sexual orientation, gender, and gender identity represented 20% of all single bias incidents reported in 2022. LGBTQ people, particularly young adults, people of color, women, and bisexual people are at heightened risk of violent victimization compared to their straight and cisgender counterparts. Transgendered individuals in particular experience a high rate of intimate partner violence with more than 54% experiencing some form of it. And then there's gun violence. Gun violence is a pervasive issue in the United States with over a million Americans shot in the past decade. The rates of gun violence are increasing across the country, and in 2021, gun deaths reached their highest level in at least 40 years, with 48,830 deaths recorded that year alone. However, it's not just gun murders that are contributing to this number. 54% of all gun-related deaths in the U.S. were suicides, and 43% were murders. Preventing violence in all of its forms is a health equity issue, it's a public health priority, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. Our first panelist is a uh, distinguished professor from the University of Maryland, Dr. Joseph Richardson. He's a professor of African American Studies and Anthropology from the Department of African American Studies in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland. He is the Joel and Kim Feller Endowed Professor of African American Studies and Anthropology. His research focuses on gun violence, the intersection of structural violence, interpersonal violence, and trauma 
among black boys and young black men, the intersection of the criminal justice and healthcare systems in lives of young black men, and parenting strategies for low-income black male youth. Dr. Richardson is the founder and executive director of the Transformative Research and Applied Violence Intervention Lab, also known as Travail. Dr. Richardson, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a real honor to have you. Thank you, Dean, for having me. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, and I've been listening carefully to some of the things that you've been saying. You have tremendous insight in understanding the perpetuation of violence in the lives of young black men. Can you talk about adverse child experiences and the way in which the continuation, the cycle of violence also continue, uh, continues the trauma, the stress, and the strain that so many black men in our country experience beginning uh, in childhood? Sure. So I, I want to start out by framing the context of what adverse childhood experiences are. So adverse childhood experiences could range from a child witnessing uh, domestic abuse in their household to a parent being incarcerated to exposure to violence in your community. So a study was done in DC and there was a report uh, published by the DC Policy Center which found that 89 percent of black children living in Washington DC live within a half mile of a homicide in 2021. If you compare that to to white children in DC, the number was 57%. So just in terms of the disparities in exposure to violence, and that could mean you heard of a violent incident happening close to your home, uh, you may have a relative or friend who was the victim of a violent injury, or you may have actually directly witnessed um, violence occurring in your neighborhood. And the studies that we have, um, that have been conducted in terms of adverse child experiences that found that children who are even exposed to violence that could occur four to six blocks away from their home are more likely to show up in a trauma center or an emergency department for a mental health disorder. <clears throat> and so all of that, if left undiagnosed and untreated, will manifest itself in high-risk behaviors in adulthood. Yes. And so what we really are attempting to do to address those issues are directly targeting what those upstream factors are. Because what we find with people who are adults and have suffered from early, either early violent mortality, and I also serve as the uh, co-chair of the DC Violence Fatality Review Committee. So as part of our um, task, we review all the homicides that have occurred in DC in one year. So for example, last year there were 203 homicides. In 2021, there were 226. So for our homicide review, we're reviewing 2021, 226 people were killed. And we're responsible for bringing together multiple agencies uh, that are around the table. We have DC MPD, which is our Metropolitan Police Department, our Office of the Attorney General, Department of Health, which I'm so glad we have a panelist that was former the, the Director of the Department of Health for DC, um, as well as Department of Youth Services, Youth, uh, rehabilitation services, which is oversees our juvenile justice system. But what we consistently find among early, uh, among deaths among early uh, young people, what we typically find are upstream issues such as absenteeism from school. We consistently see that. Involvement in the juvenile justice system. Undiagnosed and untreated mental health disorders, which typically start very early on. Um, in the work that I've conducted with young men in a trauma center at University of Maryland Capital Region Health where I established the first hospital violence intervention program out of that trauma center. We work with young men who have been violently injured with the intent that we can reduce the level of trauma recidivism. And what do I mean by that? People who are injured but then will come back to the trauma center for a repeat violent injury. So for example, if you were shot in 2020, and you suffer from a gunshot wound, the likelihood of you coming back to the trauma center can reach up to 65%. I don't think many people can understand and can contextualize that, how many of our patients who we treat are often have a history of injury, whether it's interpersonal violence or, or structural violence as well. 
But what we often find in, when we engage them in psychotherapy to prevent trauma recidivism is that many of the challenges that they're, they deal with and face are not necessarily related to the injury, the, the gunshot wound, but also are related to childhood experiences that happen very early on in their lives. Yeah. Right, so we have young people who have experienced abuse in their homes, who have witnessed the incarceration of a parent, and uh, I have uh, one of my colleagues, and, it, it, and if you watch DC News within the past two weeks, one of my, um, one of my colleagues and, and associates who I work really closely with, he guest lectures my class, Tony Lewis, who is an advocate for um, reentry and uh, working with people who have come out of, of prisons in DC. Uh, his father was recently released from prison after serving 34 years. His father went to jail when he was nine. So just put that into context in terms of what that means regarding early childhood experience, adverse childhood experiences. Experiencing, which would be akin to almost a death of a parent, right? And many young people um, suffer from adverse childhood experiences and often are not treated for um, the trauma associated with it. And, and those behaviors play out in adulthood which then leads to what we see as the cycle of young people who have been injured coming back into the trauma unit for a repeat injury. Those kinds of um, stories and perspectives are so incredibly valuable. I began this, I set up our session tonight with some statistics. Oftentimes we're looking to data to understand the circumstance. Here's another really important statistic, and that is in 2022, the leading cause of death for American children became violence became guns, violent crime. That was true for the entire country, but in fact that's been true for black children since 2006. That the leading cause of death among black children has been violence since 2006. So we can pull out a lot of statistics. I'm an epidemiologist, so we rely a lot on data to understand the problem and to understand population patterns. And at the same time, as an anthropologist, what has one of the many things that has struck me about your work is the ability to highlight narrative and right. story. Um, right. I've heard you speak about the importance of narrative. I've also heard you speak about the importance of social media and that connection, as well as looking to youth for solutions rather than top-down approaches. So Correct. can you speak to that? Oh, that's a lot. So, <laughs> uh, so I've been I'm trained as a criminologist and anthropologist, so I like to couch um, my responses in, in narratives because I think people often can connect with the narrative. So I'll give you an example of the ways that the healthcare system and the criminal justice system intersect and hopefully people will get something out of this. So there was a, a young man um, in my hospital violence intervention program who prior to participating in our program at the age of 22 years old, he was shot by a jump out squad from um, DC MPD. And so the reason why I mention that is because there's a, the national narrative around jump out squads, Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee, so I'm sure many of people have seen the footage of that, um, Sean Bell in New York City, um, and the Gun Trace Task Force in Baltimore, which there were nine officers who were convicted of corruption and planting guns and drugs on many of the black residents in Baltimore City neighborhoods. And so this young man, um, was standing outside one night, jump out squad, jumps out of their car, um, gun tra a gun recovery unit, and six plainclothes police officers. They're supposed to wear their badges. They were in an unmarked car. They didn't identify themselves. They pulled their guns out. He had a gun. He gets shot six times. He's treated at my hospital, and uh, after he's patched up, he, he has to wear a colostomy bag. He's immediately sent to D.C. jail. What happens in D.C., because D.C. To, DC is the only jurisdiction in the United States where residents are not sent to a local or state prison, they're sent to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So you could be sent to a prison anywhere in the country, California, North Dakota, 
Texas, thousands of miles away from your family. So he's sent to the D.C. jail and then summarily he's convicted for a firearm offense and he's sent to federal prison. He's 22 um, for three and a half years. He gets out. He now has a felony. And what we have found in our research is the number one risk factor for bringing a young black man back to the trauma unit is if they have a history of incarceration. Well, why is that so important? Because the collateral consequences of having a felony essentially places you in a, a form of second class citizenship in the United States. So there's a, uh, one of my colleagues who recently passed, Diva Pager, sociologists had done this really insightful study on the effects of, of a, con a conviction on labor employment opportunities. And so she sent out two testers, and I, you mentioned the testers yes. in our, in our in, conversation. In mm -hmm. uh, so she sent out two testers. This was in Chicago, one white, one black. She had given them both similar resumes, but one applicant had a conviction on his resume and the other did not. And what she found ultimately is that a white male with a felony record has a greater likelihood of getting a call back for a job than a black male with no record at all. Which essentially says if you're black and you're male, regardless of whether you have a felony conviction or not, it's equivalent to being a felon, right? right? And so in terms of labor market chances and employment, that affects your ability to get a job. And I say all that to say this, Young person gets out of jail, three and a half years later, he comes back to Washington, D.C., he tries to get a job, he cannot get a job, he has a felony on his record. So he returns to his only way of knowing how to survive, which is this economic, economic crimes for survival. He is then shot again because he's carrying a gun, which raises the risk of being injured. Again, he's shot 10 times. He comes into our trauma center. At that time, we have our hospital violence intervention program. We managed to get him engaged in services, and I would say maybe a month or two later, he, he tells us that his colostomy bag is irritating him. Fine, so we set up a, an emergency examination with our trauma surgeon, Dr. Jack Mather, one of the you know, top surgeons in, in terms of um, gunshot wounds in the country, and he determines that he should have an emergency procedure to reverse the colostomy bag, which means to remove it. So that happens immediately. Um, within a few weeks. So ultimately, the colostomy bag is removed, but think about the trajectory of what happened in this person's life. They're shot by the police, right, from a, from a gun trace task force unit that has a notorious reputation to the point where it has been disbanded in D.C. He goes to prison. During his entire stretch in prison, the correctional healthcare system never identifies that the colostomy bag should have been removed. And I don't know how many of you understand the, the mental trauma of wearing a colostomy bag, but for people that have to wear one, that is also a traumatic experience that someone has to live through daily. Gets out, suffers from the collateral consequences of having a felony, injured again, comes into our hospital, patched up, and even during that period, it still wasn't identified that the colostomy bag should have been removed. So imagine, there are 40 hospital violence intervention programs in the world. He was lucky enough to come to a hospital violence intervention program that I started two years ago. There are hundreds of level one trauma centers in the country. He could have ended up in any one of them, and they may have never been detected. Mm -hmm. So in these, in just in terms of that story yeah. alone, mm -hmm. there's a lot of intersections between the healthcare and the criminal justice system and why we need to address many of the upstream factors that young black men suffer from beyond just the gunshot wound, yeah. but just in terms of, of the quality of healthcare, the quality of life in many of the neighborhoods which lead to life expectancies in D.C. where one neighborhood in southeast D.C., life expectancy is 68, any other neighborhood in Northwest DC, which may be predominantly white and affluent, the life expectancy is 89. So in the nation's capital, 20 minutes, a uh, neighborhood 20 minutes away, you lose roughly 21 years of your life based on your zip code. Yep. That's, cha that's problematic in it's this It's highly country. problematic. It's highly problematic. And the, the story of that gentleman 
is so illustrative in the many different intersections, criminal justice and healthcare and psychology and anthropology as well, um, right. and really understanding the uh, how in so many ways systemic racism was at play in uh, uh, writing his life. Exactly. Uh, we talked about testers because I mentioned in the early 90s when I was a graduate school uh, student in um, Baltimore, I was I served as a tester for fair housing. So I was the white equivalent who was going to apply for housing, and then I had a black counterpart exactly the same age, um, background, same resume, et cetera. And time and time again, we demonstrated how I always got the application for the uh, apartment, whereas my black counterpart um, uh, friend did not. So uh, that was front and center, and it was a powerful experience in the 90s. Right. And can I add one more thing? Be yes, because I'll, I don't, I'll, I'll turn be to Dr. This and I, I, Dr. Kessel. I, one more thing I had. Um, where we are now in terms of the field with law enforcement and clinical spaces and what we, what we have been experiencing over the past few years, uh, law enforcement um, in the trauma center interrogating people who have been victims of maybe multiple gunshot wounds, interrogating patients as trauma surgeons are cutting off their clothes, young people at the age of 15 interrogated in hospital rooms that who may have suffered from being in the wrong place at the wrong time and injured by a stray bullet, um, police officers and law enforcement interrogating 15-year-olds without the presence of a legal guardian, right? These are all things that we've experienced in this space and we're now fortunately moving towards more ED physicians and trauma surgeons engaging in the work such as my colleague Dr. Aaron Hall at uh, uh, Washington Hospital Center to address law enforcement and clinical spaces because we also <coughs> see the intersection of the criminal justice system and the healthcare system within hospitals and for many people who don't who are not uh, well versed in the way that looks in a hospital it occurs every single day in this country where law enforcement, based on who may who the attending surgeon in that trauma bay may be, will actually allow the police to engage in those kind of egregious practices mm -hmm. of blaming the victim for a crime. And this is a person who may be on the threshold of dying. Right, when they're trying to save lives. Save lives mm -hmm. and their their presence is in a trauma bay. Right. So And you're seeing that play out um, constantly. Right, and but we now have ED and trauma physicians who are now, um, for example, my, my colleague Dr. Tanya Zacherson developed a program at the University of Chicago called Praxis where they're training ED physicians, medical residents, and trauma surgeons um, in structural justice, right? So they're aware of this is the, that physicians do have the power to address what they see in terms of the the egregious behavior of law enforcement within clinical spaces. And so a I'm powerful that, intersection. So I'm glad that's happening right a now. A powerful intersection with uh, interprofessional education as well. Yes. Um, at our College of Public Health, we also have a School of Nursing and also a Department of Social Work. So we're constantly talking about those places of intersection and what you just described in that space is a, a powerful illustration. I'm going to turn to Dr. Kessel. Uh, I'm delighted to, that Dr. Woody Kessel has agreed to join us. He's um, former Assistant Surgeon General, uh, Senior Scholar at the Coop Institute at the Geisel School of Medicine in Dartmouth, um, also Professor of Pediatrics at the uh, Geisel School of Medicine, and Professor of the Practice at the School of Public Health, University of Maryland. Um, Dr. Kessel is a policy leader and community pediatrician for over 30 years as an advocate, ed educator, and researcher in public health, public policy, and pediatrics, and maternal and child health. He's had a distinguished career in the U.S. Public Health Service, serving as Assistant Surgeon General and a Senior Program Director for Applied Research, Community-Based <coughs> Programs, and Professional Education. He was senior advisor on policy, uh, public health, health policy, and child and family health matters to the White House, cabinet secretary, surgeon generals, health and human services officials spanning eight administrations. It's a real honor that you have um, been able to join us tonight, Dr. Kessel. Thank you. I am um, eager to talk to you about of the many things that you've been involved with over the course of your career, a distinguished career, how do you find yourself in the violence prevention space? That's the first question I have. And then also, we were talking uh, previously about some historical events 
that have in part contributed to where we are now. And I was hoping you could talk to um, the audience about the Dickey Amendment and what you remember about that milestone as well. Well, Dean Perry, um, thank you for including me with my colleagues to talk about uh, something that's tragic in this country. We're talking about violence. We're talking about how we perpetrate harm on ourselves, colleagues, neighbors in the community, the awareness of violence. We're at war in the world. We see violence every time we turn the news on, hard to watch. But to go back um, over 50 years ago, when I was a medical student in the South Bronx, South Bronx, notorious place for more barbed wire in the South Bronx than anywhere in the United States. And um, I was a medical student, and looking back, when I was a medical student, thinking about pediatrics and children and what my colleague Joe talks about, the hallmark of pediatrics is prevention, is promoting well-being. It isn't the intervention of treating trauma. It's preventing those events. Fifty some odd years ago, the leading cause of death for children was infectious disease, was pneumonia. Um, there were some, certainly cancer, there were some congenital anomalies. Certainly there were injuries. The principal injuries that we worried about then was children ingesting medications that were too readily available. Uh, that their parents were taking, regular prescribed medications, not illegal substances, but just access uh, to medications, even aspirin. And we took that on and we put some safety caps and we did education campaigns about trying to make a difference in securing um, um, medications. Certainly there were deaths from automobile injury. Um, you know, again, 50 years, long time. We're, we're now so used to buckling up, wearing seat belts, improved technology for our automobiles, better road design, better car designs, airbags, car safety seats. Can't go home from the hospital without being, uh, you won't be discharged unless you're secured in a car safety seat. Things changed, certainly over time, and as the dean reported, it's absolutely outrageous to me that America is murdering its children. It's not a statistic. We're allowing our children to be murdered. Many of the young people that Joe is talking about are young people. They're children. They're adolescents involved in these events. There's an epidemic of suicide in young people. My first experience in the South Bronx was an eight-year-old who shot their brother. I can still feel the energy from that. The eight-year-old thought it was a loaded weapon, thought it was a toy. Unintentionally shot, pulled the trigger. From then on, I struggled with how do we deal with biological threats to the health of children, and those threats that we've created or failed to take action on. And I spent most of my career struggling uh, um, with those kinds of uh, uh, issues. It's just painful to me as a pediatrician. Prevention, safety, safe storage, Every automobile, all the automobiles that you own, and, and thank you for coming and hopefully joining this conversation. We're certainly pleased to be here at, at, at George Mason, and um, your president has shown some leadership along with our president at University of Maryland. Nowhere in this country have university presidents stepped up and taken on the responsibility of trying to prevent gun violence in this country. Some. 20 presidents in our region have taken this on and added their voice um, 
um, to this issue. But I've been struggling with these, whether they were the adverse childhood experiences, direct trauma to, uh, to children, and certainly continuing to care for kids. Um, but in pediatrics, we safety is part of the culture. Store your medications properly. Uh, we had a Mr. Yuk campaign. Some of you may remember some of that, where we labeled harmful substances, where we used to keep them under the sink. You know, kids are what? Smart, curious, want to get into things, you know? Um, so we took that on. We took on, again, car safety. In addition to gun violence, it's supplanted. It supplants automobile injuries as the leading cause of death. Because we've made progress. We've been smart, thoughtful. Every automobile has a key. Children can't access to it. We're, we're, we've made progress in so many areas. But with gun violence, guns are frequently, there's some five million children in this country who live in homes with guns not properly, adequately stored, stored with the chamber having ammunition in it. Um, gun safety has become a really polarized argument when, from a pediatric point of view, it's simply build a fence around your swimming pool, child-proof the kids, help them learn about swimming, provide some, some basic safety education. Um, and we now have, from homicide, and many of those people are young people in our communities, suicide. It's lethal to take a weapon. And then what we, what we have is something called unintentional injuries. Children who think these weapons, not safely secured, loaded, think they're toys. Six-year-old shoots a teacher in Virginia. Last week, school shootings. You've seen on the television, young people in all of our communities, probably in this campus as well, certainly in University of Maryland, saying, I want to go to school to learn. I don't want to go to school to hide under my chair or to be directed into the hallway on a school shooter drill or to be afraid that I might not come home. How is it that we've created this environment in this culture? And hopefully collectively we can join and work together to find some solutions uh, to all of this. And some of the solutions are, frankly, from my perspective, straightforward, safe storage. Everything that we do in public health is based on science. And it's critical to have the understanding of what's the nature of the problem. The adverse childhood experiences were developed by a colleague Vince Folletti many, many years ago, just looking in a cumulative way what was an added way to look at kids experiencing what Joe talked about, more significance, child abuse, and looking at, at what threshold did the mental health of that child, did the growth and development of that child become compromised because of experiencing adverse uh, events. And unfortunately, as an example of the polarization in this country, um, um, we said, we're not going to study this problem. Yeah. We're going to put a moratorium on federal investments in trying to understand basic issues. It wasn't about advocacy. It was, what's the problem? What are the contributing factors? And how do we think about and unfortunately, Congressman Dickey, who's no longer uh, alive, ended up um, successfully getting Congress to stop investing in research at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He recanted later on, appreciating that that was not his intention. His original intention, and this is where some confusion occurs, 
was not to amass the science, but, you know, again, the Second Amendment, advocacy for or against, and we suffered the years. Fortunately, we're recovering from that at the moment, but we are certainly far behind in what we need to understand. What are the, some of the basic principles? And the goal, again, as Joe mentioned, is to prevent these events, whether it's in childhood or it's you know, on the street, it's in our communities, in our homes, in our churches, in our grocery stores, in our schools. It's pervasive. We want to prevent this so this isn't the leading cause of death for children and on our nightly news. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And that historical perspective is really important and very uh, necessary here for the conversation tonight. I'm going to uh, turn to Dr. Nesbitt. Um, Dr. Nesbitt, I uh, have admired your work. Um, all the years that you served so fearlessly as commission of, uh, Commissioner of um, uh, Health for Washington, D.C. Um, you're currently Executive Director at George Washington University, the uh, School of Medicine and Health Sciences, uh, the Center for Population Health Sciences and Health Equity, and also Senior Associate Dean for Population Health and Health, Health Equity. Very exciting. Um, this new capacity. Uh, Dr. Nesbitt is a board certified fa family physician with more than a decade of experience leading population health initiatives in governmental public health agencies. Most recently, she served as the director of DC Health and led the district's COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic response. Oh my gosh, thank you, thank you, thank you. A remarkable uh, job. In this role, she mobilized organizations and community to implement innovative solutions to promote health and wellness. She also served as interim director of the district's uh, Department of Behavioral Health. Signature areas of her legacy in DC include violence prevention and also health equity. I wanted to tell you a quick story. The other um, day I was driving to uh, Northeast DC to Costco on Market Street. And I was with my son, my 10 year old son, and I noticed some of those um, signs that you stick in the ground and the sign said, DC, Maryland, Virginia, conceal and carry, call this number. And it was a picture of a handgun. And I turned around, stopped with my son, David. I said, can you take a picture of that? I'll have to show you the picture. And I was just so struck that, you know, what was this doing and why was this being promoted? So can you tell us more about what it was like to serve in your uh, capacity, a very important capacity for the entire, the nation's capital? and your thoughts on how to approach it from a health equity lens. So I'm apparently still causing trouble many places that I go uh, with being the person up here whose microphone doesn't work. Um, but thank you so much, Dean Perry, for hosting this uh, very important conversation during National Public Health Week. And it's extremely important that in public health we make sure that uh, people understand the broad scope of the work that public health does. I am being engaged in this dialogue around the public health approach to violence prevention and recognizing that uh, violence is indeed a public health uh, issue, whether we're talking about interpersonal violence, how diseases of despair uh, result in suicide, the impact of uh, accidents oh, as a leading cause of death uh, for children, uh, and certainly uh, what we are seeing, as Dr. Kessel mentioned, as these uh, rising uh, contribution of violence, gun violence in particular, uh, causing too many of our children to not be able to achieve their full potential in our society. Uh, which, you know, even if you only look at it for selfish reasons, means that there aren't people who can replace us um, in terms of intellectually contributing to society as our future educators, as our future uh, firemen, policemen, physicians, all of the wonderful things that they declare wanting to do and having that taken away from them uh, at very early ages. So uh, we really have to be able to act fast uh, to allow all of these young people who are losing their lives senselessly be able to achieve their full potential. Um, as, a, as a public health um, leader in governmental uh, institutions, I've had the remarkable privilege to uh, be able to do something uh, around violence, uh, which unfortunately is a Gen Xer. Uh, growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, where violent crime uh, really uh, sort of gripped and paralyzed many urban cities, um, I unfortunately had experiences with as a child. 
um, being able to have friends. Uh, you know, I remember very early in elementary school um, having a, a young person who attended my elementary school die um, from a, another kid playing at their house, um, pick up a handgun and accidentally shoot him over a weekend. Um, but then I also remember things like other very intentional uses of, of guns uh, causing harm to classmates, um, some who uh, died from those incidents and others who um, were you know, star athletes who became paraplegics and have lived that way for, um, for decades, uh, suffering from depression and all of those other things because of the, um, the acts of gun violence that were perpetrated against them. And so this work became very personal for me uh, in ways that I don't think people really realize when you become an accomplished physician, right? And mm -hmm. then people assume that, you know, well, I mean, you're just kind of doing this because people say public health should do something about it and what are your contributions? Um, but it has also allowed me to be able to look at it from the perspective of um, when you talk about what are the key drivers of health uh, and you recognize that making and creating healthy communities <laughs> Uh, doesn't rest solely on health care and access to health care services. Uh, there are so many other domains. Um, we recognize uh, that educational opportunities, employment opportunities, housing opportunities, food access, um, it all are, are contributors, transportation. You think about those things are being barriers for people get, being able to get to the doctor. But we have to recognize that community safety is also a contributor to being able to have healthy communities and impacts health equity. Yeah. And when you are able to make those connections, it's very easy for public health to be part of that discussion and for us to realize that we cannot achieve health equity, which means every person being able to achieve their optimal health and being able to do it and create those environments for people to achieve their best health in a very fair and just way without creating communities that are safe. Uh, and so it's important for us to inter interject into that dialogue. I also think it's important that we recognize when we're talking about a public health approach to violence prevention, um, it's, it's more than a conversation about bringing mental health services to community. I would find that often um, when we, when uh, especially policymakers, um, legislators in particular, whether you're talking about legislators at the local level, the state level, or even the federal level, hear a public health approach to violence prevention, they're very often thinking about the infusion of behavioral health or mental health services into community. Um, while there may be a part of the formula, it's also understanding the root causes of that violence that exist in that community. And that's where I think that having a good infrastructure or approach uh, to, um, to understanding the drivers of violence becomes important. Even in our best efforts, if we've thought of violence prevention from a public health perspective solely as being about the infusion of behavioral health services, being it mental health services for, uh, for families who have severe and persistent mental illnesses or diagnosis of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, et cetera, those individuals are more likely to be victims of violent crime than perpetrators of violent crime. I think that's important to note. When we're talking about behavioral health needs in terms of people who are unable to cope um, or who, have, who are never taught um, conflict resolution skills, now that's, that is an area for intervention and we need to be able to get people um, the services and supports they need. Um, there are connections or associations that have been documented around people who have substance use disorder and may commit uh, crimes when they have, are experiencing intoxication or acute psychosis. So yes, we may need to, we need to get people the services and supports that they need. Um, and we need people to get services and supports when they're having acute psychosis um, or psychotic breaks and they're experiencing mental illness from that perspective and they commit violent crimes. Uh, but, but it doesn't stop there. You have to understand the root causes. So when people are committing crimes because of their economic crime, are victims of violent crime because of economic, um, economic uh, opportunities that they participate in that make them likely to be victims of crime or they carry guns to provide themselves safety. You have to address why don't they have other economic opportunities? Why haven't we provided them the educational opportunities that they have to create better economic opportunities for them? 
So those are the things that when you're studying it from a public health approach, you really do understand what were the other factors that created the environments for them to become either victims or perpetrators of crime. You actually look at what um, hospital-based va violence intervention programs actually look at recidivism. Why do people continue to show up? How can we provide them supports in a very different way? If people are returning back to neighborhoods that are not supportive for them, what are the things that they need to not have to return to those neighborhoods? These are all of the things that are part of very constructive public health approaches to violence prevention. So I think those are the types of things when you talk about an equity approach, health equity approach, health equity first recognizes that equity has to be achieved by thinking more than health care. You look at all of those key drivers, and when you talk about violence prevention, it has to recognize that this isn't just about more law enforcement, mental health services. It is a very comprehensive approach that looks at what are all of the drivers for violent crime and victimization. Uh, thank you so much for unpacking that, and I'm sure it, both from your personal perspective and also in the complicated roles that you played on behalf of the nation's capital, you're able to um, dig down more deeply into the intersectionality and the interplay of a variety of different factors. So thank you for explaining that so clearly. Um, I'm going to keep going just so that we can um, also have a, a full, robust uh, conversation and also get some questions from the audience. So I'm very delighted to introduce our very own uh, Dr. De Denise Hines. She is an associate professor of social work in our College of Public Health here at George Mason. Um, Dr. Hines, is, her expertise includes the causes, consequences, and prevention of family violence and also sexual assault with a particular focus on un under-recognized victims of violence. Uh, she's the former director of the Massachusetts Family Impact Seminars and specializes in translating university-based research for policymakers. She's also very impactful in being able to tr uh, train the next generation of social workers that would have an understanding of a social work lens as we approach uh, the prevention of violence. Um, Dr. Hines, can you tell us a bit about um, what it means, some under-recognized victims of violence? Uh, can you tell us about some of the populations that you have researched and how do we better highlight and understand and reveal uh, those, the, the, the invisibility of individuals that are being targeted and um, victimized? Sure, and, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. It's, it's an honor to be with such distinguished um, researchers and practitioners in this area of violence prevention. Um, and my work focuses specifically on violence within the family and inter, inter, um, interpersonal relationships. So really focusing on people who have romantic relationships with each other um, or people who um, you know, are close in some way. Um, and so some of the under-recognized groups, um, like I, I focus mostly on intimate partner violence. Um, and so one of the things we've seen since the mid-1990s is an actual, um, and actually, actually I would say since the, the 1970s, is a, a lot of attention paid to men's violence against women in intimate partner relationships. It's something that we have paid a lot of public attention to, have had a lot of public health announcements about it, a lot of public service announcements, a huge proliferation of domestic violence services across the country with over 2,000 domestic violence agencies. And I, and I think largely as a consequence of that, and we've had some really wonderful legislation like the Violence Against Women Act, um, we have seen a decline in violence by men against women over the past several decades, which is a wonderful, I think, public health uh, accomplishment um, that, you know, paying attention to the issue and putting resources to it, um, we can see those declines in violence, and I think that's wonderful. Um, what we haven't seen are declines in other forms of um, violence in relationships where perhaps we have a same-sex couple or someone who is a, a gender minority um, or people who are bisexual, or we haven't seen declines in women's violence against men in relationships. And so those things, 
we often fail to recognize them necessarily as an act of domestic violence or as an act of sexual assault. We see the highest rates of domestic violence um, with bisexual individuals as victims. Um, we see very high rates, I think you mentioned it in the introduction, um, where transgender folks are victims. Um, and these are major problems, and I think one of the issues is, is that we don't necessarily think of domestic violence or sexual assault as occurring against people who don't fit the, what we, uh, our accomplishments of public health where we've worked on decreasing domestic violence by men against women. And so there's a whole rec under-recognized group of people based on their gender identity, their sexual orientation, that really don't have access to the services, they don't have, or they don't think they have access to services. Some services are available to them, but um, I know from talking with folks, for example, who are sexual minorities or who are gender minorities or who might be men, is that they don't think that those services have the training to be able to help them. And particularly sexual minorities and gender minorities are saying that they don't want to go to a service and have to first explain their sexual orientation or first explain their gender identity uh, and have to go through all of that and then talk about their violence victimization. And so there's a lot of training that needs to be done to sort of broaden our perspective of who can be victims of violence within families, of violence within intimate relationships. Um, so that we can achieve those same achievements that we had with domestic violence by men against women, because we, we have made major strides in that form of violence. I think that's so enlightening to really be able to um, reveal these other areas of interpersonal violence that remain largely hidden. And mm -hmm. it's a nice intersection with um, Dr. Rothbard as well, Daniel Rothbard. And I'm going to uh, come back to the notion of hate crimes um, and make that connection. So Dr. Rothbard is a professor of conflict analysis and resolution at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution here at our very own George Mason University. He specializes in prevention of mass violence, ethnic conflicts, power and conflict, the ethics of conflict resolution, civilians in war, and the psychopolitics of conflict. Uh, he currently serves as co-director of the Program on Prevention of Mass Violence. He's an author of over 10 um, books as well as uh, scores of uh, articles on these uh, areas. So you bring in a very uh, unique and um, special approach to this conversation. And so just as we heard from Dr. Hines talk about interpersonal violence, help us better understand the increase of hate crimes and the attacks on um, based on racial, ethnic, ancestry, identity, as well as gender identity. How do you see it and how, how can we better understand it? Well, thank, thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, we are focusing on intergroup violence by hate groups. Um, and we all know that the United States is experiencing uh, a, a political crisis in which hate groups are at the forefront of, um, of physical violence. Uh, the, uh, there are 733 hate groups that have been recognized by the Southern Poverty Law Center. These hate groups basically define themselves as, uh, as committed to attacking a certain identity group, of which the range is quite wide, and it changes frequently. So um, there are hate groups that take as their operational principle that violence must be committed. It is not ancillary, it is not minor, um, it is not occasional, it is in their mindset. And so violence prevention here requires violence understanding, understanding the mindset of the Proud Boys, of the Oath Keepers, of the many neo-Nazi groups uh, that we're all very familiar with. But, um, and understanding the mindset basically requires uh, delving deeply into, we just heard from a distinguished panelist, into the narratives that, that 
unite them and that target certain groups. These narratives, these stories uh, of the enemy, of the threat, and the, to put it very briefly, th the common narrative of the hate groups is that they are experiencing an existential threat. Their group, whites, you know, uh, uh, Christians or uh, Western or men, in case of the Proud Boys, are experiencing an existential threat. And the United States is experiencing an existential threat. So this is a, a narrative that plays out over and over from early years. Um, and as we heard from a distinguished panelist, we need to delve into the sources, the causes for this. Now, since this panelist, is a pa the discussion is, of course, violence prevention, um, there are two major directions of violence prevention that have been, th well, that are known. One is the criminal justice system. Obviously, when the hate groups break the law, obviously the criminal justice system has, in fact, uh, and must be operative. Uh, for example, there are 1,000 participants of the January 6th insurrection who are, who are under indictment now. That's a pretty high number. That it reflects, obviously, the intense work of many, many uh, institutions in the United States. There is another direction that I think has, that needs a lot more attention, and that is the um, conflict resolution direction. That is to say, to delve deeply into their mindset. And what I'm struck by what is not happening in the United States today, what is not happening is, and this may sound weird, but w uh, representatives from one group actually sitting in a room and having a conversation with representatives of their targeted group. This is, um, there are many conflict resolution centers trying to do this. It is obviously very difficult. There are many resistance. There's resistance to this from many people um, in the country who see these hate groups as criminals, of which some are. Um, but as I say, this there are two major directions, and I think both need to happen at the same time, and um, I, I, I would hope in the near future that there needs to be a deeper dive into exactly the underpinnings, the sources, what led them, led them to this act of violence. Um, very profound. Uh, conflict resolution, I think, uh, I, I, again, I saw a major connection with what Dr. Hines had to say as well. Um, we were talking uh, backstage previously about the critical importance of all of our work, and that is bringing people together to communicate with each other face to face and the type of alienation that happens when you are behind a screen. Um, it has been said that um, uh, it is true uh, of any machine, whether it be a car, a, a gun, or a computer, you lose a piece of your humanity. Um, and so what I wanted to ask you is um, related to the lab on transforming the mind for peace and also the psycho uh, politics of right. conflict resolution. Can you tell us more about uh, violence so, prevention? So um, in our peace lab uh, called Transforming the Mind for Peace, we are exploring different techniques for possible intervention. And we're trying to test these techniques. One technique that we find promising is to basically foster a sense of one group being curious about another group. Now, that may sound rather uh, trivial or, or not deeply I I incisive, but clearly one of the characteristics of hate groups is um, a, a, a kind of cognitive blindness and, 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 and a, a willful resistance to humanizing the other. And we, you know, we all know what are the needs for humanizing the other, curiosity, listening, uh, 
serious listening, at least uh, with some sense of respect, um, understanding, and sharing basically uh, experiences. One technique, by the way, that will not work in, in many of these cases is talking about the conflict. That is to say, when in the room, it's, there, there are many cases in which we get participants of conflicting group in a room and we ask, what are the causes of the, the political crisis in the United States, for example? So that is a scenario for basically intensifying the conflict and so on. But the techniques that I think are promising is something to humanize them, to make them see th the other as complex and sympathetic and vulnerable people. Uh, very insightful, very interesting. I want to make sure that we have uh, time for uh, questions from the audience, but before I do that, briefly in a word, I'd like to ask each of you, at uh, George Mason, our students come first. And so what message, what brief message would you have for students who are learning about violence prevention? Uh, obviously, I'm sure they're experiencing a daunting sense of I'm inheriting these problems. And what would you say to our future generation and being able to be part of the solution? If I could ask each of you in a, in a, a brief comment. What I would say is um, we've been stuck for the past in the violence intervention prevention space using the same models that we've used for the past 20 to 30 years. Okay. And at this time, we really need to be innovative and bold and take risk. And I would encourage young people to take risk with their ideas, wh whether they're, they're tried and true tested or they don't fall under being evidence-based. But using your gut and what you sense in, in terms of what may be a possible solution without having the fear to take that leap to, to create um, an innovative idea. And, and the reason, and I'm just gonna add this, the reason why I say that's so like critically important in 2015, I had written a, p a paper on um, police-involved shootings and the ways that emergency departments could document um, if someone had been shot by the police because, as we know, only 3% of law enforcement agencies submit that data to the FBI. And so healthcare systems serve as a, a critical space to document that. And when I started to interview medical staff about their feelings regarding documenting um, police-involved shootings on the ICD-10, which is an international code for injury, many were reluctant because they felt that it wasn't, they, that wasn't their lane, right? I don't, law enforcement has their job, we have our job, we're not really trying to get involved in documenting whether someone has been brutalized or shot by the police. That's really not our, our, our practice in space. And so when I, when I published the article, there was a, a, a lot of like pushback and reluctance publicly from the medical field, whether we should engage in that practice. But you fast forward 2023, and now the tide has turned, right? So, you know, what may have not have been in vogue in 2015, which was an idea that I thought, well, maybe this is the best approach. Now you have medical physicians and medical staff actually documenting and being very conscious and intentional about documenting when they've treated a patient that they feel has been brutalized by the police. So again, take the risk. Don't be afraid take of the being intellectual ahead of your risk. Time. Excellent, excellent story, Dr. Kessel. Well, let me add another contextual variable in an attempt to answer your thoughtful question. You know, we've talked about mortality, death, forty-five thousand. There's five times the number of people that are injured and communities and families talk about an adverse childhood experience, an adverse community experience. I served uh, with a family foundation at Sandy Hook and got to know many of the families there. And now those young people who survived, I now see their friends, their colleagues, they've grown up. They're now in college. They may well be here some of them at, at George Mason or, or at our local universities. And, and I think the trauma that we experience 
one of the little girls that was murdered at Sandy Hook, Abiel Richmond, became good friends with their family and, and her, her dad committed suicide five years later. So this nightmare is reported in the data, but it's also not captured completely in how it continues and it affects all of us. But I think the positive thing is, the other night in Tennessee, the students have risen up, letting their voices be heard about what needs to be done, that this can't continue. Our students, on armed with the best of science and the thoughtfulness that each one of the academic domains, but it's gonna be the young people. I met now Congressman Max Frost, the youngest congressman who survived the trauma in, in Florida. And thank God it's our young people and the people on this campus and the students. I, I don't like these words, but I'm gonna use this one, armed with the facts, armed with the science, who can not only talk about the need for better legislation, more thoughtful legislation, but to take the wisdom of this group and, and certainly in your community and apply it in the community. Apply it in the community. It doesn't take, laws may be helpful, but to store your guns safely, it's just thoughtful. It's what we do with, we lock up our alcohol, we lock up many different things. But I think, for me, the optimism is now the student voices, the students on campus, the students in high school, the students who are now tragically growing up as survivors of this nightmare, who are bringing voice and, and loud voices and challenging those people who think um, that this is not a public health nightmare. Dr. Nesbitt. Yeah, I, I would say um, to the students who are moving it into this field uh, where there will be tremendous opportunity to be successful uh, is that most of your work will be done in a manner that is data driven and tech enabled. Um, but you'll be most successful if you always remember to be driven by the human element of the work. Uh, and so remembering to always get the human element of the work um, th those inputs. So asking people, why, why does this matter to you? How will this impact your life? Um, what is it that I could do to make your life better? Uh, so even when you have all of the quantitative data, the epi, you have all of those things, even when you think that people would prefer to use the technology to help their lives be easier, ask them, what would they like? Just, and you don't have to have a formal focus group all the time. Just have some people you would call on the phone and say, what is the word on the street? Tell me how you think about this. That centers you in a way um, that is more impactful than you will, you will recognize at this point when you're going through coursework that is very theory driven. Um, but when you get into the real world of practice, the human element of the work um, will be what keeps you going. Excellent, thank you so much. Dr. Hines, you're in the classroom every day training our next generation of social workers. What do you want to say to social workers and beyond as they um, come to understand the problems and the opportunities for violence prevention? So I spent about a decade of my career uh, co-directing a violence prevention program on a college campus that expanded to four college campuses. And I think one of the biggest lessons I learned there was that college was too late. Um, you know, we were able to do violence prevention with college students because we didn't need par parental permission at that point in time. But we also had a lot of data that showed most of these students had already had lots of direct experience with sexual assault and dating violence and other forms of violence by the time they came into our prevention program. So the prevention was too late. We did some good work but they really need it as soon as they enter school in developmentally appropriate ways, starting in preschool all the way through high school. Um, when we have them uh, in our school system, there are certainly ways we can teach students conflict resolution skills. 
We can teach them about consent in developmentally appropriate ways. We can, can, we can teach them emotion regulation skills and distress tolerance and mindfulness techniques to help with all of these feelings that could then turn into violence. And doing it in the school system is very important because you know, the people who eventually use violence are typically experiencing it in the home. You know, people who have very healthy, functional, nonviolent home lives are, are not the ones who are necessarily going to later on end up using violence. And so we do need to use captive audiences like in schools to really teach the skills that can do violence prevention. And I think that's where students who are going to engage in the practice of violence prevention really need to penetrate and get into the schools and, and do it from a very early age. Very insightful, thank you. And finally, Dr. Rothbart, what message would you like to uh, communicate to our students and our future generation? Well, I would like to invite the students to foster the courage of compassion. And what that means is to be strong enough to engage with people who they may not disagree, they may not agree with, they might, may not like, they may even know that they committed some kind of uh, crime. Um, it's that courage that I think is important. And I'm struck by uh, and Dr. Kessel's reference to Avio Richmond is striking to me because I knew her father who committed his life to violence prevention, gun prevention, and created a center which was called the Avial Center for Neuroscience and uh, Peace Building, I think. Um, and he devoted his, his life to that. He was, uh, he was a inspiring person to everybody who met him. Um, but I hope students can basically foster that. Uh, that's a very powerful message as well. I'm very mindful of time. And so we have just about five minutes for any questions that we might have in the audience. You've been all very attentive and very um, polite and patient with us, and we're eager to hear what is on your mind, some questions that you'd like to ask of our panelists. And we have um, someone that can provide a microphone. And if you could please stand as you ask the question. Hello. Okay, it works. Um, I, my name is Ray, and I work in the um, events department in the College of Public Health, so I don't have a lot of experience with public health. But when Dr. Rothbart, you were talking, you were talking about conflict resolution and putting um, two, you know, a hate group or representatives of the hate group and representatives of the targeted group in a room in a conversation. And I just thought about how I get so exhausted <laughs> whenever I talk about, you know, anything that affects me in that way, or even when it's just friendship, you know, and they say something that bothered me, and I talk to them about why it bothered me, or however long it takes, you know, and I feel so fatigued after. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be, like, that person. I don't want to be the person educating them. So how do we protect the targeted audience when they're having these conversations? Because it's not easy, obviously. Well, there's a a challenge among peace builders for self-care. There's a, a, a need for well-being of peace builders. And what you're saying is that need and that challenge is exponentially more pressing, of course, for people who are targeted. So I don't know. I'm you know, the details right now of a particular intervention, I mean, those have to be worked out. Who is going to go in the room? Uh, for how long? Should that come after the dialogue occurs within the hate group first? In other words, it can be staged. So there's many different techniques, there's many different decisions, but at all cost, 
the vulnerable population group should not be um, uh, experience a, a triggering or some kind of um, intensity of that. Um, let me just say that this method is very common with international uh, conflicts of mass violence, and it's not unusual for representatives of the victim, and I'm not suggesting this, that you know, anyone individually do this, but it's not unusual for representatives of the victimized groups t to shake hands. I've seen this. I've done this to shake hands with perpetrators of human rights violation. Um, so it's, it's not impossible, but it does just depend on the circumstance. Excellent. Uh, do we have another question in the audience? Yes, right in the front, front row. Here comes the microphone. Yes. Uh, is the microphone working? It is. It's hard to tell when you're the one using it. So mm -hmm. my name's Sebastian. I have a question for the same person over here, um, which is what value do you believe that an organized approach to dialogue uh, with regards to hate groups would be, but given that nearly all of the stories I've heard of mm -hmm. people leaving hate groups have been people who essentially deprogram themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that a attempting to ca cause that approach would be valuable or would it be viable? Uh, I think it would be viable and I think it is critical for long-term prevention. Prevention requires delving into the mindset before the, the physical violence to explore the, the, the mental violence that they're living with, the, the obviously the violence of hate. So some method of communicating, of listening, of, of, of learning, and basically you use the word, I think you use the word deprogramming, this, uh, that, that their threat is not the other people basically. So I think that this is a viable method. I don't see in the long term um, that criminal justice intervention is the only method. I don't see that as basically the only direction to go because frequently that's after the physical, physical violence. Excellent point. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to end it there, but I'm really struck about the cross-resonating themes that uh, all of you have brought up. Um, we have uh, expertise in criminal justice and anthropology, uh, pediatrics, um, we have health equity, we have interpersonal violence, and we have peace and conflict resolution. And you can start to see these places of intersection. It's my hope that this is not just a one-off conversation for Public Health Week. This has to be a long-term enduring conversation and at the same time imagine us a year from now coming back and checking in and seeing some mm -hmm. meaningful change, especially in our ability to engage students in a meaningful way as well and the way in which we are coming together to dialogue and to exercise humanity and compassion. So I really want to thank each of you for your time, for your expertise, for your continued work in this space. And um, I wish you much success. Thank you very much, and thank you to the audience.